Hi there. Hello. And that's the sound of the Science and Eternity team. And this is the Science and Eternity podcast, a uh, place where we explore the relationship between groundbreaking science and the human experience. This week, we're talking about the question, can we outsource our memories? I'm your presenter, Tom Cousins, and with me today is Noreen Herzfeld. She's the Ruta Professor of Science and Religion at St. John University, Minnesota. Noreen holds degrees in computer science, mathematics, and a PhD in theology. She's the author of multiple books and articles. Hello, Noreen. Hello, Tom. Hi there. Um, So today we're talking about memory, and in particular, uploading our memory to machines. Now, outsourcing our memory sounds super sci-fi, uploading our minds to machines and living eternally in cyberspace. Uh, Do we think, Noreen, that that's a pipe dream? Not exactly. Um, There are certainly people who are imagining that soon we'll be able to just upload the entire contents of the human brain to a computer. But it's also a fact that we have long been recording our memories, outsourcing them to one technology or another. If you look at some of the earliest uh, Babylonian tablets, people developed writing precisely to outsource particular memories that uh, they couldn't keep in their heads. You know, how many sheep somebody has, how many goats they've got. Um, So... Writing um, and many other technologies, the impetus for them has been to outsource our memories. Mm -hmm. Why is it, do you think, that there's such a desire to outsource our memories? Because memory fades. Our memories are fallible. Um, Our memories are partial. And uh, particularly when we need to remember details and particulars, Uh, Our memories just, uh, over time, degrade. They're not up to the task. So I was recently in Svalbard uh, filming a settlement called Pyramiden, which is a settlement that was abandoned in the 1990s, has remained largely unchanged for the last few decades. And it really got me thinking um, about memory, remembering the past. Um, And being a Russian settlement, there was also this, in my mind, this other connection with Um, this fascinating Russian billionaire who's running something called the 2045 Project, in which he plans to upload his memories, uh, the entirety of his memories, to a machine by 2045. So I I find the 2045 Project really interesting, kind of, I I think, really exciting, um, but also a a little bit weird. It's not that weird. When you really think about it, we all upload parts of our memory or depend on outsourced memory. I mean, how many times a day do you think of something and if the answer doesn't come right to you, you pick up your machine, you Google it, and there it is. Not loads. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think there are massive advantages to outsourcing our memories. Uh, the first is that we can maintain or retain financial information. Um, we can retain information about experiences of our past photographs uh, on on uh, social media. I have thousands of fa- photos of family events, things going way back into my teens. Um, I think there are medicinal benefits. Uh, memory loss is associated with some medical conditions and often associated with old age and being able to retain memory, um, I think is really significant for the well-being of the elderly. And I think in terms of the justice system as well, if you have a memory of exactly what happened um, that's infallible, uh, it can provide um, really effective solutions for cases that are sometimes ambiguous. I think outsourcing a memory is um, not simply something that we've desired to do in the past. It's becoming clearer and clearer that it's advantageous now in the present day as well. Well, the benefits actually go further than that. When you think about what a computer actually is, it is mostly memory. Memory with a very fast processor added to it. So think about a few examples. For example, when Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, one of the reasons Deep Blue was able to do that was that it was able to have in its database a memory of every single game Kasparov had ever played. Now, no human chess player is going to have that much memory. They'll know, okay, Kasparov often uses this gambit or that opening, but the computer could sort through and look at every single time Kasparov had made a certain move 
and what the result of that move had been several moves down the road. Um, right now, AI is a big buzzword. And really, a lot of what we call artificial intelligence right now is simply massive databases of information and programs that can rapidly search those databases looking for correlations and patterns. And so it really is memory that is powering the computer, the whole computer sector right now. It seems like the advantages um, for memory and outsourcing memory are very clear. Um, but it's, it's also got me thinking about the nature of memory. And in fact, a lot of your work revolves around how human memory is um, distinct or different in some ways to the memory that we might find in machines. Uh, do, do you think then that um, human memory could effectively be outsourced to machines? Is it, is it that simple? Well, the problem is that computer memory and human memory are quite different. Um, computer memory is very large. That's one of its biggest advantages. It's also static. And as you mentioned before, that can be a big advantage that you have unchanging memories from the past. But that's not how human memory works at all. When we remember something, we actually do not store the entire event that happened. We store bits and pieces, and we store these bits and pieces in different parts of our brain. When we pull the memory back up, it's very much um, like reassembling a dinosaur once you've dug up the bones. You put together the bits and pieces, and then, like a good director, you fill in all the gaps. Um, this makes human memory, in some ways, um, very changeable. Because every time you bring that memory up, It'll have some gaps, and you'll fill in those gaps based on what is happening in your life at the moment you are remembering the past. When you refile that memory, there will be ways in which the present has changed the past, in which the memory has been subtly altered. You can kind of think of it as that uh, children's game of telephone where you have a whole line of children and somebody whispers something at the beginning and each child whispers it to the next child. You know, by the time you get to the end, you've often got something quite different than what you started out with. Mm -hmm. And our memories can be very much the same. Each time we remember something, we remember it slightly differently than we did the time before. Uh, to me, that sounds disadvantageous in that a memory which changes with time isn't really a memory at all, is it? Well, it is a memory. Um, we would like to think that our memories are, you know, simply something that is preserved and unchangeable, always exactly the same just as we might preserve something in a computer. But actually, we use our memories in a different way. They're part of a narrative process that helps us ascribe meaning to what happens. What we store when we store a memory isn't just bare facts. We store with it often a lot of sensory imagery. In fact, it's often um, cues from the senses that help us to bring a memory back to life. If you think about the famous scene in Proust's uh, A la Recherche des Temps Perdus, where he bites into a madeleine and he suddenly remembers his, his aunt's house. And it was the smell and the taste of the madeleine and the tea that brought that back. So a memory often has different pieces to it, sensory pieces, informational pieces, and an emotional valence that uh, records how you felt about something that happened, about a person, a place, or an event. This can be a good thing. It's been used therapeutically with people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. They remember a traumatic event, and they have with it associated a really strong emotion. 
And they find that if they ask the person who is suffering from this to deliberately recall the event and narrate it as a third person observer instead of someone who is in the midst of the event, it tones down the emotions associated with that event. As the person restores the memory, they restore it with a lower emotional feeling and this helps them so that the event is no longer quite as traumatic as it was at first. That, that is fascinating. And I, I, think, I think, though, the change in that memory is a change, perhaps, in perspective. And I think one of the things that uh, we were saying earlier is that our memories actually degrade and perhaps even falsify information. I think the this most recent way of changing memory where um, we change the meaning associated with a certain event is very useful but is our, our actual recollection of changing the actual recollection of that event i.e. it happened in a different way to how it actually happened is that advantageous or disadvantageous? It's very common for one thing because of the way we fill in the missing gaps um, an example that I can give you is when I met, first met a colleague of mine at the university. Um, we met, he was telling, actually, he was walking with another colleague telling a dirty joke. I didn't know it was a dirty joke. I fell in step with them, and he stopped right before the punchline. Of course, my, the other colleague turned to him and he said, well, what's the punchline? And Nick said, well, not with a lady present. At that point, Steve turned, looked at me and said, oh, it's okay, that's no lady, that's just Noreen. Now, the interesting thing is that when my colleague and I go back and remember this episode, we both remember that part, exactly what Steve said, because it was so unusual. But what we remember differently is that he thinks this happened in September at the first faculty meeting of the year in the building in which his office takes place. I think it happened at a much later faculty meeting in December and that we were walking into a snowy parking lot out of the building in which my office <laughs> is. Now you can see how each one of us stored what we thought was the most important part of that memory and then we filled in the gaps in a different way. Yeah, Noreen, this is, this is one of the things I find uh, most interesting about our conversation is that you're a great storyteller, you love telling stories, um, and this is something that many psychologists have noted, that we are inherent storytellers and will often prefer to uh, communicate meaning over facts. And as with your story, uh, the meaning of the story remains the same for both you and your friend, but the details of it um, change. And I think in, in, in the sense of details, actually it makes a lot of sense to outsource our memories so that we can remember important things like when something happened. But in terms of storytelling and making connections and meaning, it seems like uh, human memory is quite distinct. Is that, a, is that a good distinction to draw? I think that's a very good distinction. Uh, we are storytelling animals, and as the psychologist Dan McAdams has pointed out, stories are less about facts and more about meaning. As we put together the story, uh, we yes, we do embellish on it, we do fill in different details, and in a way, uh, we construct the past in doing that. Um, it's interesting to note that, at least in America right now, memoir is the most uh, common um, or the most frequently published genre at the moment. And I think this has to, something to do with the fact that people are looking for meaning in their lives. They're looking for a way to understand the past. You see, if you just store the facts, your life becomes less of a story and more just of a scrapbook. Lots of disjointed pieces. But for us to truly have meaning in our lives and to truly understand both where we come from and where we're going, we need to put a narrative to all of those facts. The details, well, you know, the details might not matter all that much. What really ends up mattering most for us 
is the narrative arc that helps us to have a consistent sense of self, a consistent sense of who we are that stretches back into the past and that we can project forward into the future. I think this is, this is one thing that really interests me about your work and links very strongly with our theme of time, that um, human memory processes information that it's stored far after the fact. Um, there's this neurobiologist called uh, Kobe Rosenblum who says, whilst an artificial brain absorbs information and immediately saves it in its memory, the human brain continues to process information long after it's received. And the quality of the memories depend on how the information is being processed. Uh, and this is something I've also noticed about your work, Noreen, that um, the changing of memory with time is incredibly significant. Why is it, why is it so significant? It's significant on two levels. I mean, first of all, we've been talking about the individual and individual's memories. And it's significant for the person in that um, it's important for us to forget some things. If we remember everything, we get to a point where, in a sense, we can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, Jose Borges has a wonderful short story called Funicel Memorioso in which he describes a young man who uh, has an accident falling off a horse and suddenly he can remember everything, every detail, you know, what he had for breakfast, exactly what the clouds looked like in the sky five days ago. The interesting thing is, this isn't just a fictional story. There actually was a Russian journalist, Sherchevsky, who could remember in that much detail. And the interesting thing about him was that while he could remember all of these details, he was utterly incapable of analytic thought. Another good thing in forgetting is we tend to remember pleasant things more strongly than we remember unpleasant things. I mean, other than things that were exceedingly traumatic. And this lets us put uh, a softer emotional feeling on the people and the events of our past. We find that it's actually a symptom of people who have clinical depression that they are unable to do this, that they do not selectively remember the good things. Because we also remember selectively more good things about ourselves than bad things. That's absolutely fascinating. I think it, it brings us right back to computer memory, doesn't it? Because something that um, can be outsourced, um, which doesn't change, uh, means that it can't be forgotten. Actually, as a society, I think we're going to have to change some of our standards. We're rapidly reaching a point where we're going to have very few people who could be a candidate for political office that aren't going to have nude selfies out there somewhere. <laughs> and you mentioned justice, but the interesting thing is, even if they don't have nude selfies out there now, of course, we've got the technology to make them. It's pretty mm. easy with Photoshop to alter a photograph, and we've now got deep fakes out there on the market where you can alter a video. That used to be a little bit beyond our capability, but now you can superimpose someone's head onto the body of someone else. And this is being used right now in America, um, often by ex-partners to blackmail their former partner. What that means, though, for us as a society is that we simply have to become a little bit more forgiving. And this, too, is a function of forgetting, that we tend to forgive as we forget over time, as an event loses its strong emotional resonance with us, and we begin to remember the event in less of a harsh light. That's totally fascinating. Because we, we started this conversation by saying that um, forgetting is something we really don't like. It seems to be a product of aging. Um, it seems to have uh, r real negative effects in, in, in terms of forgetting, for instance, uh, information that's vital to our finances or information that's vital even to our, um, to our ancestors in survival. Um, but... Uh, to turn it on its head, we're saying that in some cases, 
um, forgetting is fundamental to the human experience. For that reason, do you, do you, how do you uh, how do you perceive outsourcing memory? Do you think it um, on balance is it a good or a bad thing? If we go back to Dmitry Iskov's twenty forty five project, I think thinking that we can store all of our memory onto a computer, that we can outsource all of it, that would be the curse. You know, the ancient Greeks uh, had the river Lethe, and before one would enter the afterlife, one had to wade through this river, and it was the river of forgetting. And I think we have to wade through the river of forgetting, both in our lives and particularly as we pass in our lives from one place to another, from one stage to another, even from one idea to another. The neuroscientist Warren, Warren McCulloch writes, as our memories become increasingly stored, we become prisoners of our yesterdays. <laughs> so we need to outsource some things, the details, the bits and pieces, but we can't outsource all of it. To do so, Itzkov would end up with a memory that would be like your deserted Russian settlement in Norway. It would be something frozen in time, but not vibrant, not alive, not moving ahead into the future. Noreen, thank you so much for that. Um, that last response was totally, totally fascinating, and I kind of want I want to leave it entirely there. I feel like I couldn't ask you any more questions that would get a better answer on memory because it. Um, I I think we innately know that uh, outsourcing our minds completely to a machine feels weird, but I think you've put words to something that many of us feel, and I know that myself listening to you has put words to something that I've felt as well when exploring this topic. Um, and I think uh, a question I'm gonna go away with is when we ask about outsourcing memory, um, uh, do we consider um, the importance of forgetting? Do we consider the importance of change? So thank you, Noreen. Uh, this episode, we've been considering memory and how memory changes with time. So it's more our personal experience of time. Uh, next time, we're going to be considering uh, entropy, which is the arrow of time, how things tend to decay over time. Uh, so see you there.